previously on the British Broadcasting Century podcast, end of April 1923, and the BBC moves home. But how did it find this permanent premises to begin with? Even before he took the helm of good ship auntie, Captain John Reith had Savoy Hill in his sights. Back on December the 18th and 19th, 1922, Reith joined four other men in scouring the streets of London for a home for the Beeb. Arthur Burroughs and Cecil Lewis, newly appointed BBC programme department, are white, not the lemonade chap, this was the BBC engineer, for a bit, and chair of the pre-BBC Broadcasting Committee, Sir William Noble, all gathered on the corner of Kingsway and Aldwych and shook hands for the first time. Right in front of them, a building was in construction by Irving T. Bush, and one day it would bear his name as Bush House. But the BBC wouldn't be involved there for another 18 years. Down to the Thames, they spied the Institute of Electrical Engineers there on Savoy Hill. Sir William Noble had been here earlier that summer, arguing and debating the BBC into being via numerous meetings with the big six wireless firms, and it was here on October the 18th, 1922, that the BBC was formed with 200 representatives gathering in one small antechamber on the second floor. A month later, the BBC had begun broadcasting up the road in Marconi House, so a month after that, the BBC's first awesome foursome were now gawping up at Savoy Hill, wondering, could this be home? Well, Reith didn't think so at first. As dusk was falling, we came to Savoy Hill. It seemed the worst of all. Well, first they had to track down the caretaker, got lost for some time between Savoy Place, Savoy Hill and Savoy Street, a problem that will come up again on launch night of this episode. What a depressing place it was. It had been used for some mysterious medical activities, vacated some months earlier. Much dirt and depression had accumulated since then. It was difficult to see any convenient arrangement for offices, but if ever the windows at the end of one vast chamber could be made transparent, a fine river panorama would be obtainable. They could, and were. After due partitioning, it became my room and remained. I believe it had one of the finest views in town. So that's Reith's office. In March 1923, he and head office moved in from the borrowed premises at Magnet House. But programme boss Arthur Burroughs was more on the lookout for studios. There is vacant a large room, 44 foot by 27 foot, which by arrangement would make an excellent concert room and the necessary retiring room for artistes. This is on the third floor, and adjacent to it on the same floor are three rooms, 20 foot by 12 foot, one room 12 foot by 12 foot, and one anteroom 12 foot by 7 foot. On the second floor, below these rooms, is another set of rooms of similar floor space. The combined rental, including rates for the ten rooms and top litter room for studio use, would be £850 per annum. And so it was decided. Last episode, the studios too left their temporary home as Marconi House gave one last burst of Hawaiian guitar music. But as one door closes... Another one opens, this time welcoming the BBC's staff of 30, plus invited VIPs and journalists to a grand old launch night on May the 1st, 1923. This is the occasion of the opening of our new studio at 2 Savoy Hill, London. And may I say, this one day is one of the most crucial and funniest of the BBC's history. All we have tales to tell of cakes, booze and rousing speeches. We will recreate what we can in this special episode, opening the building that would last nine years, taking us all the way to Broadcasting House, where the Beeb still resides today. Welcome to the Savoy Hill era of the British Broadcasting Century. Hello, hello, this is Paul Carenza calling. This is London Calling. London Calling indeed, but from a new address. Hello, hello, I'm Paul Carenza, and since episode nine of this podcast, 2LO, the London Broadcasting Station, has come from Marconi House here on our timeline of the origins of the BBC. Now on episode 83, we finally move with the BBC down the road to Savoy Hill. If, by the way, you would like a little walking tour of this area, I'll be doing one soon, so drop me an email for details, paul at paulcarenza.com, because yes, this is Paul Carenza, and welcome to the British Broadcasting Century podcast. This is actually one of my favourite episodes, because we're just focusing on one amazing day in the BBC's history. We built a studio on the top floor, which for some obscure reason, I can't remember why, was not known as Studio One, but as Studio Three. Perhaps because it was on the third floor, I don't know. Maybe. (laughs) It was 38 feet by 18 feet, and it was formally opened by Lord Birkenhead on the 1st of May, 1923. The BBC may not have made much of its departure from Marconi House 
the day before, 30th of April 1923. But here on the 1st of May, it made a big old song and dance about its opening at Savoy Hill. Thanks to the benevolence of today's BBC, especially the BBC Written Archive Centre, we've been granted permission to read for you almost every speech given at that launch night. So we will immerse you in what it would have been like welcoming this new BBC HQ. Savoy Hill was quite the most pleasant club in London, so said early radio critic Gail Pedrick on 1950s light programme programme, These Radio Times. There were coal fires and visitors were welcomed by a most distinguished looking gentleman who would conduct them to a cosy private room and offer whiskey and soda. Oh, and you could always be certain of running into great men like H.G. Wells, Bernard Shaw, G.K. Chesterton or Hilaire Belloc. As for who that most distinguished looking gentleman was who would be conducting you into a cosy private room... At half past five... Colonel R.H. Brand, who was called the host, and he was also a tennis commentator, and the two duty announcers for the evening used to don black ties, and they would greet the artists in the hall as they came to broadcast. They would take them into the green room just adjacent, um, give them a drink, and then conduct them up to the studios. Arthur Phillips. I would have to accompany people to the studio. I can remember taking up Amy Johnson, Gracie Fields, C.B. Cochran, Edgar Wallace, take them up to the studios, and... and uh, generally fetch and carry for the artists. My greatest moment when I found John Snag knew my name. Mind you, he only said, Philip's going to get my supper, but at least that was something. He would be yet to come as Savoy Hill opened. So we'll return to Arthur Phillips on a future podcast and his Savoy Hill memories. For now, we just need to open the place. It was quite a first night. But before that, what was Reith up to during that day? Well, we begin with something not even at Savoy Hill. 11 a.m., May the 1st, 1923, the Sykes Committee began meeting. You might recall a few episodes ago we told you about this. It's the first government inquiry into the BBC set up when it turned out the original agreement to start broadcasting was, um, well, if not rushed into, not quite thought through, particularly regarding licences. So not enough people were buying them, not enough funds were coming in, but some in government, including the Postmaster General in charge of it all, thought the BBC was getting quite enough thank you and they should stop complaining and just broadcast with a couple of tin cans and a bit of string between them. Meanwhile, Reith and the Beeb thought the government were reneging on collecting licence income or making little effort to do so. Now, we'll have more on the Sykes Inquiry in a future episode, but its first meeting was that morning. Reith miraculously had muscled his way onto the committee itself, along with nine others, mostly MPs, including Charles Trevelyan MP, grandfather of Laura Trevelyan, former BBC news anchor, JJ Astor MP of the Astor dynasty, WH Eccles, former assistant to Marconi and future designer of the first longwave station at Daventry. And as for the committee's chair, not much impressed by Sir Frederick Sykes, Reith grumbled that day. The committee would meet on and off for four months. The dispute between the British Broadcasting Company and the Postmaster General has been shelved pending the deliberations of the committee, reported the Scotsman that day. And by the Scotsman, I don't mean wreath. It's a newspaper. So these, then, were the conditions of Savoy Hill's launch. Parts of the government and press against the BBC wanting to shrink it or kill it before it had even reached half a year old. Two days later, a Daily Herald headline ran, Will broadcasting be closed down? So Savoy Hill needed a launch that was celebratory, yes, but defiant, determined, reminding listeners in that the BBC was worth listening in to and here to stay. So expect that fiery notion within the speeches we'll hear this episode. So just as the Sykes inquiry was getting underway, so did Savoy Hill's first broadcast at 11.30am, a morning concert, including baritone Charles Grant. Now, at first, I couldn't find anything in any book, on any website, on the BBC genome, of what Savoy Hill's first music was. All a bit vague. But it is nice to know, isn't it? So then I remembered my notes from the BBC Written Archive Centre. So, a little bit of sifting later, and here we are. Programme as broadcast from Tuolo London Station of the British Broadcasting Company Limited, 569 metres, 11.30 to 12.30, Tuesday 1st of May 1923. That's what we're after. So, the first music from Savoy Hill. Firstly, the 2LO Orchestra plays a march. The Children of the Regiment by the Czech composer Fucic. 
many of these pieces were grand. Not just because it was a launch event, but because they now had a studio three times as big as the one at Marconi House. Room for more musicians and a bigger sound. So expect marches, military bands and a bit of showing off. Second piece was the Overture Raymond by Ambroise Thomas. Nope, me neither. And then Charles Grant sang Breen of Glenna and a song called Cobbling. Nice. The orchestra then returned with the Arcadians, uh, Charles Grant again with Sanderson's Captain Mao and East Hope Martin's All the Fun of the Fair uh, before Savoy Hill's first concert ended with Martel's The Night Patrol. All of these, if I'm honest, are new to me. A jaunty start then, though the main evening concert would be the proper opening ceremony. But it looks like some of the finer details of that opening ceremony were only planned that very day. So John Reith, the boss of the Beeb, finished at the Sykes Committee. Then he lunched at the Savoy with Lord Gainford, BBC chairman. Because if you can't lunch at the Savoy Hotel, what's the point of being at Savoy Hill in the first place? And then Reith returned to the office, a stone's throw away, to find his secretary, Isabel Shields, asking him who should be present at that evening's ceremony. Oh, you'd better tell Anderson and Eckersley to be there. That's Major Anderson, the company secretary, who Reith already didn't like, and Peter Eckersley, of course, the chief engineer. Oh, and uh, perhaps Round had better be there, seeing that it is Marconi equipment. Captain H.J. Round, Marconi chief engineer, we met back on episode two of this podcast, and we've met him many times since. One of the key developers of broadcasting many years before. Uh, how shall they be dressed? Asked Miss Shields, and Reith replied, Oh, they'd better put on evening clothes. So Miss Shields told Mrs. Eckersley, Round and Anderson, and each one then called home and asked Mrs. Eckersley, Mrs. Anderson and Mrs. Round if they wouldn't mind awfully bringing in their glad rags. Yep, that very afternoon. It was all a bit of a rush, so Eckersley's suit arrived, but no collar. Captain Round's waistcoat was left at home. Handily, though, Mrs. Anderson couldn't decide whether to bring the dinner jacket or the tail suit, so she brought both. So the other two men seized on the spare suit like vultures, even though it was far too big for them. Now, Reith had popped out for dinner, again with Lord Gainford, and uh, this time with Lord Burnham and Sir William Bull. That was Reith's old boss, the MP that he helped regain his seat, who was now, in turn, on the board of the Beeb. There were speeches to plan over dinner, or maybe even write over dinner. And again, the Savoy Hotel was so close. It was practically the BBC canteen for management anyway. Sir Reith then returned in his finery to see Peter Eckersley, half his face buried in Anderson's giant shirt collar, and Captain Round, who's now in Anderson's low-hanging spare waistcoat, drooping below the belt line. Handily, Captain Round being who he was, he was back to his shirt again very shortly, jacket off, sleeves rolled up, tinkering with Tuolo's transmitter. Because they had a transmission to make. So children's stories went on the air from 5.30 as usual, this time featuring editor of Locomotive News, John Hope Fellows, who told the Chiddlers about model railways. Choo-choo! And then the guests arrived while this was on the air. British Wireless Broadcasting Company's second floor was the notice pinned up by the commissionaire, Mr Plater. An ironic name given that he was waiting for a plate to arrive for several months, in fact. So, yes, that hand-scrawled note that greeted them outside the building actually said... British Wireless Broadcasting Company. Welcome, everybody, to Savoy Hill, the home of the BWBC, apparently. Someone should have told Mr Plater what the name of the business was. But upstairs, Chief Engineer Peter Eckersley was giving journalists a tour of the ins and outs of the Savoy Hill studios and corridors. Showed them a new standard time clock that gave the regulated time signals direct from the Eiffel Tower. Magnifique. All part of the effort to give more accurate time signals to listeners in, especially for rural listeners who, um, I guess, may not live near an accurate clock. And they had a new microphone there that day, installed by Captain Round, of course, the Marconi Sykes magnetophone. Eckersley also showed off the new studio, an echoless room, that very quickly proved unpopular with all who spoke in it. So said another engineer, joining the BBC from Marconi's a few weeks later, Harold Bishop. Studio 3 in Savoy Hill was acoustically very oppressive, and it was a very difficult studio to use. Echoless because of the heavy curtains and six layers of sacking on the walls and ceiling, plus a very thick carpet. On all sides it was there to deaden the sound, and it did a little too much. There was no echo and it was a most oppressive place to work in. How people sang and how people played musical instruments in that studio I could never understand. 
This is 2 0, the London station of the British Broadcasting Company calling. At 7 o'clock, then, news and weather announced by Rex Palmer, and then the official launch on the air as the band of the Grenadier Guards played four songs at 7 30. The first of those, Pomp and Circumstance. That same music opened Abbey Road Studios eight years later. And here's the thing, I uh, I shared on our Facebook group and on Twitter recently uh, a clipping that we discovered of the BBC's 10th anniversary event from 1932 at Radio Olympia. And on this news clipping, they list lots of the first firsts of broadcasting, but they get some of them wrong. I was always a bit baffled to see that Pomp and Circumstance was listed as the very first song on the BBC. But planning this episode, I now see that Pomp and Circumstance was the first song played at Savoy Hill. It does make me wonder if, to some degree, the record sort of thought of Savoy Hill as the start of the BBC proper. If only on this occasion they started to see that actually the BBC had truly begun. Maybe all before was prologue. So meanwhile, what of the party off air? Well, John Reith's order for catering was essentially cakes from a lion's tea shop. A little buffet in one of the rooms there. But the secretary, Major Anderson, well, he was an army man through and through, and he realised that if you're going to get the band of the Grenadier Guards to come and play for you, they might want something a little stronger than tea, cakes and lemonade. So Anderson had hidden in his office a fair amount of booze. Beer and whiskey, to be precise. And yet, to spare Reith's blushes, he had hidden them. So the band finished playing, and then were tipped off that that's where the good stuff was. Unfortunately, word spread, and so one by one, people slowly left Reith's rather genteel buffet and gradually joined the alcoholic party in Anderson's office. Sir William Noble, the chair of the Broadcasting Committee, yep, he was one of the first to get over there, apparently. And the rest of the board of directors were very quick to sneak away from Reith and towards the beer. As the whiskey kept flowing, there were apparently good-natured jests about Wreath and his pink tea party. And unfortunately, just as one of these jokes ended in raucous laughter, Wreath walked in and glared at all of the VIPs, the board of directors, the grenadier guards, and at the centre of it, the secretary that he loathed anyway, Major Anderson, all with their beers, whiskies, and laughs at Wreath's expense. Well, there was some on-air comedy as well. Good evening, everybody. Eight o'clock, Norman Long, the first entertainer from Savoy Hill, credited as a song, a smile and a piano, although you can't hear a smile. Here's one of Norman Long's from a later year. We can't let you broadcast that. Now, the BBC once wrote to me and said, Dear Norman Long, we thought you'd like to face the mic with your piano smile and song. So will you bring your repertoire along for us to see? He was the first entertainer to be made by radio, so they say. Norman Long was also at the first Royal Command performance in 1927. I have nothing more to add now except to say to you, good night, everybody. Good night. But back at Savoy Hill, after Norman Long, it was the Grenadier Guards Band once again with a solo cornet, playing Mary of Argyle, Reminiscences of England, and then at 8.30, the speeches begin. First of all, Sir William Bull MP, Reith's former boss. I am very pleased to be present at the interesting ceremony and address for the first time an audience I cannot see. I watch with interest, but not alarm, the attacks which are made upon the broadcasting company. The company was formed at the request of the government to save the fiasco that has occurred in the United States, where pandemonium reigns. We are not out to make money, but merely to protect British trade from the host of foreigners who are taking advantage of the position. The newspaper proprietors, theatre managers and gramophone people can no more keep back broadcasting than Mrs Partington could sweep back the Atlantic with a mop. It is not the broadcasting company who is responsible for this, but the irresistible march of invention. The time will shortly come when every man, whilst he is dressing, will have a resume of all the news to which he can listen when he is shaving as a matter of course. The newspapers seem to think this will damage their business. It will not do anything of the kind. Gas shares went down when electricity was invented, but electricity in any shape did not hurt gas in the least. There are a great many difficulties to be overcome, but I am sure, with a little goodwill on all sides, everything will soon be right. The public must have a little patience with an invention which has shot ahead from week to week and almost got out of control. In the meantime... The public are enjoying a Brock's benefit of fireworks from the roofs of their houses without having to pay for the rockets. This is through no fault of their own, 
but simply because no one foresaw where broadcasting would go. Broadcasting is not yet, by any means, a perfected invention. During the next year, I prophesy, there will be further great strides made. I am sure, when the public knew the true facts of the case of the broadcasting company, they will see we have done our utmost to be fair to all parties. So William Ball. More music from Daisy Kennedy, a solo violinist who played Romance in G Major, from Beethoven, Turkish March, Old Viennese Folk Song, accompanied at the piano by Miss Ella EMA. And then the next speech, Lord Gainford, chairman of the British Broadcasting Company. And thanks to a re-recording he did nine years later, his is the only speech we can listen to today, still voiced by that man himself, given by Lord Gainford, written for him by John Reith. As chairman of the British Broadcasting Company, and on the occasion of the opening of our new London studio, I am glad to have the opportunity of saying a few words to our many thousands of listeners in throughout the country. He began by noting that the provincial stations were closing down for a few minutes, just so that London could be picked up anywhere, and then commented that he wished they could all see what fine accommodation they had there in that new London studio, claiming that this could be the greatest studio in the world. He then went on to defend the BBC. The broadcasting company is not a monopoly. Last year, the manufacturers of wireless apparatus met together by invitation of the post office, as it was realized that broadcasting would have to be controlled by one broadcasting authority if the chaos, which today is so obvious in America, were to be avoided here. He then went on to talk about the precise figures in terms of income, uh, the unpredictability of listeners actually making their own sets and thus dodging paying any money to the broadcasting company. I want you to understand that in addition to trying to protect our 600 manufacturing members, we have never lost sight of the interests of the general public. I hope that the present position may soon improve and brought to a satisfactory issue by the committee which the government have appointed. We are not going to stop broadcasting. Broadcasting has come to stay. He noted that Manchester and Birmingham were getting upgraded stations very shortly that summer, and gesturing to the Grenadier Guards band in front of him, said how their contract had been extended throughout the year, with other military bands joining them on the air. He name-checked Percy Pitt, the new musical controller, saying this will help spread music throughout the land. And he looked ahead, too, to the new men's talks starting later that evening with Lord Birkenhead, although he hadn't shown up yet. Yes, this was a missing broadcaster set to close the night. And the women's hour will be starting the next day, first given by Her Royal Highness Princess Alice. He concluded by saying once again that these were not just for the London station and reassured listeners that they were all working tirelessly for all of their benefits to increase broadcasting and improve their lives across Britain. We shall win through, and in order to do this quickly, we need a continuance of your support. Please let us have it, and be assured we are out to do our very best for you. More music. Uh, Norman Long was back to entertain again, and then the Grenadier Guard Band with three Irish dances. News and a weather report at 9.45. Ah, and then the closing speech. 10 o'clock, Lord Birkenhead was scheduled to give the closing speech of the day, which would also be the first men's hour. Women's hour would start the next day, and indeed, next episode of this podcast. But where is Lord Birkenhead? Has anyone seen Lord Birkenhead? They phoned his home, nowhere to be seen. They tried his mobile, they realised that hadn't been invented yet. Eventually, Lord Birkenhead, the big closer, was found, not at Savoy Hill, but at the Savoy Hotel next door. Easy mistake to make. Far nicer bar as well. So the Deputy Director of Programme, Cecil Lewis, Uncle Caractacus on the air, and another employee was sent to go and find and fetch Lord Birkenhead. By force, if necessary. Sure enough, there he was in the Savoy Hotel bar, thinking he was essentially in the artiste's waiting area. I was deputed to go across the road to the Savoy, where his lordship was presiding at a private dinner in the pinafore room. Decades later, Cecil Lewis recalled a few of the details a little differently. I knew nothing then of his weakness, but on entering the room, I saw at once that the noble earl was drunk. You know, I'd never normally resort to Wikipedia as a source, but let me give you the headline of Lord Birkenhead. A skilled orator, noted for his wit, pugnacious views, and hard living and drinking. Yeah, what a booking for the first night of the BBC at Savoy Hill. Contrast that with Wreath and his tea and cake party. Bless him. I was filled with consternation. In ten minutes, he had to be on the air. England was waiting. How the devil was I going to get this man across the road and up into the studio in time? A secretary went and whispered to him. 
he seemed to recollect that he had made the appointment, lurched to his feet and came across to me and allowed me to conduct him through the corridors, out into the street, ungraciously shaking off my arm when I attempted to guide him. I hoped the fresh air might sober him up, but it evidently did not, for he positively reeled into our lift and, without saying a word to me, entered the studio. I was convinced we were in for a disaster, and saw the scandal of it echoing around the country. But it was too late to stop anything now. Reith was delighted to see Cecil Lewis supporting Lord Birkenhead, though Lewis nudged Reith and said, He's high as a kite. Birkenhead could not find his notes, and said, That's all right. I don't need any notes. If I had them, I certainly wouldn't allow anyone to censor them for me. So here goes. Well, that being said, the BBC Written Archive Centre does have a printed sheet by Lord Birkenhead for this particular event. So was this the speech he meant to give but went off piste? Was it written down after? Who can say? Either way. The red light came on. The ears of the country were connected to our microphone. Reith made a brief announcement introducing the great man. Ladies and gentlemen, with the initial men's talk of the BBC, Lord Birkenhead. It was then the miracle happened. Swaying backwards and forwards on his feet with a glazed expression, Birkenhead delivered absolutely impromptu a brilliant comment, perfectly phrased, clearly articulated, absolutely to the point. Ladies and gentlemen, I am invited on an occasion which I admit interests me to make some observations upon this remarkable modern invention of broadcasting. What this invention has done is not generally completely realised. At the present moment, nearly tens of millions of people in the United States are able to hear what is said by means of this method of communication. Whether what is said is sufficient inducement to listen in, I am not in a position to say. And then Birkenhead started talking about the idea of broadcasting and the question of who might pay for this, and then mentioned the fact that a certain British newspaper had started this campaign against the BBC, but that listeners in would not fall for it, surely, as they realised that broadcasting was a great social service. Differences have arisen between the British Broadcasting Company and the theatrical companies. Well, I should have thought that these difficulties were capable of adjustment. After all, if it be true that 10 millions of people in the United States, and a considerable number of people in this country are nightly listening to the broadcast service. Some basis of cooperation, reasonable in itself and acceptable to all parties, must be reached between the theatrical and the broadcasting services. An artiste, who by severe labour, arduous study and natural endeavour has achieved supreme genius in the representation of the role of Hamlet, ought not to be compelled to limit his genius to an audience of a few hundreds or thousands when it might be enjoyed by hundreds of thousands, or even millions. And it is in the interests of the artists that some definite arrangement should be arrived at. The artiste must live but he can only continue to be successful and appreciated in proportion as he is known. How foolish it would be if the artist is limited to an audience of thousands. But as I have said, he might be delighting an audience of millions. And then Birkenhead said that he hoped that theatrical managers could come together with the broadcasters to find a way forward. He summed up before reaching for that next glass of whiskey. In conclusion, I would say this, and I have been speaking to an unsympathetic audience as represented by the instrument towards which I have directed these remarks. Many and varied are the movements which science has given to us in the last 25 years. If you carry a search further back 35 or 40 years, you are confronted with the beginnings of the telephone, a system which a hundred years ago would have been considered incredible and laughable. Today it's a commonplace that the human voice can be carried to Vienna and Berlin, the invention which we are celebrating tonight can carry into all parts of the country the most divine notes of the most divine singers and the speeches which may sway senates and determine the destinies of empires. Here we are met in a small room surrounding a small microphone. I do not think any of us claim any credit for this invention. Apart from Captain Round, who actually did invent that particular microphone. He must have grumbled at those words. But we all rejoice that we were born in an age which enables us, if we have any voice of wisdom or any message of faith worthy of the world, to duplicate and triplicate and still further elaborate that message to all the nations of the world. And Lord Birkin had sat or fell down. As Cecil Lewis concluded, Wreath, as he conducted our great guest out of the studio, caught my eye and gave me a ghost of a smile. It was the firm and fierce defence of the BBC that Wreath wanted, even if he rather it was delivered in a sober way. 
Coming the same day as the Sykes inquiry into the BBC began, this was a welcome message to listeners from someone as authoritative as lawyer and politician Lord Birkenhead. And surely, if even a drunk man can see that the government need to honour their commitments, it should make common sense to everybody. The inaugural men's talk concludes its first night tomorrow, the 2nd of May, as we'll find on the next episode. It was a more genteel women's hour launch. Yes, not women's hour, but women's hour next time. Dr Kate Murphy tells us all about it. Don't miss it. After Lord Birkenhead, the band of the Grenadier Guards concluded the evening with Granger's colonial song, Molly on the Shore, Lo Hear the Gentle Lark, a duet on clarinet and flute, and finally, A Voyage in a Troop Ship Fantasy by G. Miller Sr. Concluding, of course, as ever, with God Save the King. Although by this point, probably a rather sozzled rendition. But then that does suit the closing talk of the evening as well. A couple of other things that day. Uh, May the 1st was also Stanton Jeffrey's new music department, with Percy Pitt joining that as well, so that was growing. Savoy Hill gained a music library under Frank Hook. Rex Palmer, the opening announcer for Savoy Hill, replaced Stanton Jeffries as Tuolo's station director. So that Savoy Hill launched for now, just taking up a portion of the building, but within a few months it would pretty much take over the entire space. We built another studio on the first floor of two Savoy Hill, and then we extended northwards, rebuilding the northeast corner of the block, which had been demolished, as a matter of fact, by a Zeppelin bomb in 1917. Okay. And eventually, I think we had some seven or eight studios in that part of the building. Just time before we go for an airwave memory. We've not had this for some time on the podcast, but we do like to hear from you, dear listener, if you have a memory of listening to radio in your youth. And this has been sent to us by Charles Huff. Charles has great memories of early radio. We played many of his reminiscences on our 100 Years in 100 Minutes special, but here's a little more from Charles Huff. My name is Charles Huff, and many years ago, before I went freelance, I used to produce and direct programmes for BBC television, science department, things like Tomorrow's World. And for several years, I series produced a series called The Great Egg Race, which was a totally eccentric programme, but great fun to do, with Professor Heinz Wolf as our uh, presenter. Before that, incidentally, I was a videotape editor. So if your podcast eventually moves on to actually getting television into it, and you want to know a little bit about how video editing progressed from physically cutting the tape with iron filings and a microscope uh, to doing it a little bit more artistically, then uh, I could give you a few details. In fact, I think I was the first person in the Beeb to edit a drama offline, which meant we could use a little bit more artistry and get a little bit closer to the way film editors worked. I uh, have always loved radio, though, despite being in television. And I think one of the reasons was my parents were very late in getting a television set. And even when they did, it was second hand and only received one channel. And then, frankly, only if you hit it just in the right place. So uh, my childhood was very much into radio. And I particularly remember Sunday lunchtime when there'd normally be two programmes which you'd enjoy. It might be uh, Billy Cotton Band Show and then maybe The Life of the Lions or Educating Archie or Raise a Laugh. My favourite programme, though, in those days, was definitely Educating Archie. The crazy idea that Peter Bruff, who was a ventriloquist, would appear with a dummy on the radio. It had been done before. The Americans had done it. Edgar Bergen in uh, the States had done it, so it clearly worked. But I think one of the interesting things about that programme, which is very popular, is all the stars who became big stars later were chosen to be the tutor for the dummy, Archie Andrews including people like Tony Hancock, um, Max Bygraves, I think Harry Seacombe, Benny Hill, Dick Emery, I think, was there, even Bruce Forsyth. And we can probably tell how old someone is by which particular tutor they remember. In my case, it was Bernard Breslau, who used to appear every time, great clumping of feet and the catchphrase, hello, it's me, twinkle toes. If I was ill, and childhood illness, I used to get the radio, and that was great. So I stuck in bed, and my dad was about the only one strong enough to carry the radio, and lumber it into my bedroom and stand on chairs all around the room, stretching a bit of wire for the aerial. And then I could play about on the dial. And of course, in those days, the dial on the radio didn't say things like light program or home service. 
Instead, it named these various stations, exotic foreign names. I had no idea where they were. So you'd see Hilversum, Luxembourg, Moscow, and Droitwich. It sounded even more exotic than the rest. And when I tuned the dial, you'd hear three different types of things which were quite interesting. First of all, you'd just hear someone talking in foreign. No idea what language. Okay, interesting, but not that interesting. Then you spool on again, and you find Morse code, which even in my young age, I knew what that was. I recognised Morse code. Couldn't read it, of course, and it was very fast. Probably produced mechanically rather than by a human hand. But the third thing really puzzled me, and it sounded like a motorbike. This great roaring noise. And I just couldn't understand what it could be, what, no, what information it was trying to convey. Of course, now I know what it was wasn't conveying any information at all, it was doing just the opposite. It was jamming, and somewhere in the Eastern Bloc country, because this is the days of the Iron Curtain, before the Berlin Wall came down, in fact, come to think of it, before the Berlin Wall had even gone up, and uh, Eastern Bloc countries blocking the Bush House broadcasts from the World Service and Americans on the Voice of America, so that their residents wouldn't get all this nasty propaganda. Anyway, I will just mention though, when I was a video editor, I worked with all sorts of interesting people, but one name I particularly mentioned was a guy called Dennis Main Wilson. At the time when I was working with him, he was working on a program called Till Death Is Do Part. And uh, he had, of course, been a radio producer before. He's the man who started The Goons. And he's probably the greatest radio producer that ever was. He worked on so many programs. And he also had almost verbal diarrhea. He just loved chatting. I'd like to think he just found me a very good audience, but I suspect he did it to everyone. I remember him telling me why Dandy Nichols left to left this do part, which is basically the reason being she couldn't stand Warren Mitchell. Great actor, but a bit of a pain. But the story I particularly remember him telling me was he claimed that he was with the army group who rescued the first tape recorder from Germany after the Second World War. Up to that time, recording electronically or electrically by magnetism was very crude in this country. They had things called wire recorders which raced the wire through at high speed and forever breaking and he didn't want to be in the same room as them when they broke because the shutters went everywhere. And the Germans had mastered how to do it properly. And so, yeah, so Dennis Main Wilson found the first tape recorder. Anyway, I've waffled far too much. Thanks. Thank you, Charles. If you would like to send us your airwave memories, your AMs, or your first-hand memories of when you were involved in broadcasting itself, paul at paulcarenza.com is the email address. Record a voice memo on your phone or via a computer and just send a recording to me. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our trip down memory lane or Savoy Hill or Savoy Street or Savoy Place. It's very confusing. There are plenty of books and the like that I've consulted for this episode, but particularly Gary Allegan's John Reith biography from 1938 and Brian Hennessy's The Emergence of Broadcasting in Britain and his other book, Savoy Hill. And do join us next time on the podcast with Dr. Kate Murphy for Women's Hour, 2nd of May, 1923, earlier than some may think. After next time, we'll be picking up the pace a little bit. Next episode, I'm going to tell you about one day later, May the 2nd, 1923, when Women's Hour was launched. But after that, we are going to accelerate a little on the podcast. The landmarks, you see, don't crop up quite so often, the first firsts of radio. So we'll be spanning a few weeks at a time going forward, rather than as we have one day per podcast. The British Broadcasting Century is a solo operated podcast just run by little old me, Paul Carenza. Original music is by Will Farmer. It's nothing to do with the BBC, don't you know, but we are ever so grateful to the BBC and and to the BBC Written Archive Centre for their permission to broadcast the text of the speeches of Savoy Hill's opening night. BBC copyright content is reproduced courtesy of the British Broadcasting Corporation. All rights are reserved, which is why we've got them a nice little table in the corner with some tea and cakes, although see the secretary's office for something stronger. You can't share some cake with us, but you can share this podcast with your friends, your family and your loved ones, so please do via your social media of choice or via email or spoken word. Why not pick up the telephone and tell someone about this podcast? I would. I have. For more behind the scenesiness and a way of supporting the podcast, join us on patreon.com slash Paul Carenza and do rate and review us wherever you have found this podcast. Stay informed, educated and entertained. Join us next time for Women's Hour here on the British Broadcasting Century.